Hansen from Harbor UCLA uh, Medical Center, um, and Matt Rivara, who's uh, the co-host of the West Coast ISPD Journal Club, he's on as well. Um, and our presenter today is going to be uh, Jonathan Sung, who's one of our senior fellows at Harbor UCLA Medical Center, and he's going to be presenting on recruitment and training for home hemodialysis experience and lessons from the nocturnal dialysis uh, trial. And actually, I just want to make sure, Jonathan, is that you or is that a different Jonathan that's um, on? No, that's me, Dr. Shen. Okay, awesome. So you can feel free to go ahead and um, put up your title slides if you want. Put up your title slides if you want. Look at my screen. Sorry for the echo. And then I also wanted to mention. Sorry for the um, echo. And then I also wanted to mention. Um, actually, Jonathan, if you can mute just for a second. I think I don't know if the echo is coming. I don't know if the echo is coming. Okay. Um, and I also wanted to uh, introduce uh, David Rush. So David is an amazing patient advocate um, that I met along the way. He um, is a transplant recipient and he also does home hemodialysis. And so I thought it'd be great for him to uh, get his perspectives on um, being a candidate for home hemodialysis. And then I also wanted to mention that um, Dr. Tom Golfer, he is the president of um, ISPD, the North American chapter, and he's on today as well. And thanks as always to everybody um, who's on. We're just counting there's at least nine different programs here. Um, and as al always, feel free to um, you know, blow up the chat. Um, and John, Jonathan, would you prefer to have the questions come at the end or are you okay if people raise their hands during? Raise your hands during. It doesn't matter to me. Okay, great. Then I'll go ahead and uh, get the floor to you. Great. Then I'll go ahead and uh, get the floor to you. Oh, okay. Uh, can everyone see my slides? Yes. 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 Okay, great. So the paper is about recruitment and training for home chemo, and they uh, and they did include actually this paper about nocturnal dialysis and that includes both in center and um, the home version. So kind of just some background about the study. Uh, in, so this study was done in around 2009-2010 so this, this is why the data is kind of showing from that time but in 2009 uh, about 0.8% of chronic dialysis patients are actually on home dialysis HHD in the United States. In Canada, it's about 2.8%, and contrasted to that, New Zealand is about 25%. So there's obviously a, some sort of disparity, at least in Northern America, uh, or Northern American patients about wanting to do home chemo. Um, there are some studies which have been shown that home chemo does improve mortality, or reduces mortality, I guess, um, can control blood pressure better, they get better medication regimens, uh, even they've even shown like after six months that you can part and reduce LVH. Um, and this was mostly on nocturnal chemo, and that includes N, so I kind of abbreviate as NHHC, which is nocturnal home hemodialysis, as well as in center nocturnal hemodialysis. Um, and that they may have similar survival rates to kidney transplant patients as, as compared to just normal chronic dialysis patients. Um, and so a lot of this was trying to assess why there is such a big barrier towards home chemo, whether that be the day version or the night version um, in the United States. So this one was really just focused on uh, in-center chronic hemodialysis to a home version, mostly during the day. And a lot of this was trying to perceive why uh, patients were reluctant to switch or convert to home chemo. So how they kind of did this was they had eight clinical centers, about four in the US and four in Canada, and uh, they, they looked how long it took to train patients, um, as well as seeing how they did and what things might, what they perceived as barriers and what kind of were barriers. Um, and the way they based, the, basically the two arms were one for conventional chemo in center about three times a week. And then the nocturnal home chemo version, which was about six times a week for about six to eight hours. Uh, they, they, Enrolled about 100 patients, but only about 87 were eventually randomized. So 42 to conventional and 45 to chemo. And they based the character, they tried to match it um, based off of, depending on what country they were in, 
to either the US system or the Canadian system about what patient baseline characteristics are, and they followed them for about 14 months. And again, there were about 100 total, but 30 dropped out just because of recruitment and randomization. And so basically, this was done around in 2008, 2010. Uh, so the data is a little old compared to where we are now. Um, but this is kind of how the trial was run. So about 118 patients again, 31 dropped out, and a total of 87 are randomized. And there were um, some exclusion criteria. Uh, this is kind of a general uh, diagram about the patient population. So you can kind of see the US side over here, and this is what they based off the US patients compared to. Uh, they had the Canadian cohort. Um, and so when they were comparing this, these are kind of just patients in there in that specific thing. And then this is the trial that they used. Uh, I'm not sure why the ends over here are different than what was given in the actual data set in terms of how they randomized the patient. Um, but it does roughly, this is 87. And again, I'm just not sure how this, oh, oh sorry, this is just randomized from different countries. Um, and you can kind of see they, they, this was a slightly younger population than the typical average for hemodialysis. But they tried as their best to try and maximize um, or um. make the breakdowns the same in terms of race and even educational standard because one of the biggest things was they were trying to figure out whether age or educational uh, achievement would play a role into being effective for home hemo and how that would in training for home hemo. So the way they assessed uh, barriers was they created a questionnaire. Um, they didn't really have a supplemental index in the PDF, uh, but they consisted of 94 questions. And they were generally directed for why patients didn't want to do home chemo. And then they did include nocturnal chemo both. Uh, and then they made a scale from one to five, one being never a barrier and five basically always a barrier. And they broke down by different categories. So whether they thought that like two thirds, a super majority thought it was a common barrier, whether it was a common barrier, but not a super majority, and then whether people viewed it as an uncommon barrier, depending on how they kind of frame it. Um, as well as, and so one of the key things is that uh, they did also look at whole modification categories. So one of the big things about the trial was that some of the patients, in fact, vast majority of the patients actually needed this. And so a lot of the costs were not uh, covered by the patient. They didn't have to do any of it. It was covered by the dialysis provider, like their center or, and, or the study. Uh, so these are the common modifications that they need, water purification, electronic telephone, or even plumbing and structural uh, to try and meet those. And they use this specific machine, the Phineas 2008 H or K machine. Um, and the training time that they used was defined as a number of total treatments required for any purposes regardless of randomization or prior experience, simply because some of these patients did have some exposure before, whether that's uh, using a catheter, whether that's using a fistula, self-cannulating, um, even potentially home exposure, like home hemodialysis exposure before. So the patients were kind of random. They were randomized, and but the data wasn't super collect, wasn't really collected on what their patient's uh, background was to really separate them that effectively. Um, so these are kind of the results. Uh, in this one, you can kind of see the common barriers that patients had. And again, it was divided by greater than 66% and 33 to 66%. And you can kind of see the most, and these are kind of uh, ranked in order of most importance. So the biggest ones are probably lack of motivation, um, often because patients are often too comfortable in, 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 um, and they have a routine that's already established. Um, and then the other one is either some form of cannulation issue. So whether that's doing it themselves, the self-cannulation, or having the needle falling out, or the catheter falling out, and having bleeding issues. There was concern for the nocturnal chemo, whether or not they could sleep comfortably being attached to a machine. Um, and then there were kind of other things that are maybe less modifiable, such as lack of family support um, or fear of machines. And then you kind of see sometimes age did play a role in some of these patients' uh, barriers. Sometimes the training was thought to be too long, um, and there is some financial burden down here too in terms of water, electricity bills, as well as um, not having professionals nearby in case something does happen. Uh, a lot of the benefits, though, is kind of what we would, as providers, think that we would be providing patients if they were to do home hemo, kind of like 
if they were to do PD. So they get more flexible scheduling, the prescriptions tend to be better, they tend to have better hypotension, you don't have to travel, so travel time tends to be uh, reduced. They may be able to have a more liberalized diet, especially with the nocturnal version. Um, and they definitely get more privacy. And you know, oftentimes we do have difficulty sometimes with our patients coming to the in-clinic at least regularly or on time. And so this time, this is one of the benefits is that sometimes they be able to be a little more um, open with what they can do at home. Okay. Oh, this slide got kind of got changed. I see. Okay. So uh, I don't know why this slide got off. Okay. So one of the things is they looked at the different centers and they wanted to see whether or not um, coffee an issue simply because 83 of the 87 required home renovation. And again, even though these were covered in this specific study by either the dialysis center or the study itself, uh, you can kind of see that the price range for the different places had a pretty big wide range in terms of how much uh, cost was required to renovate their home. So you kind of see in some of the Canadian areas, it was it can range somewhere between 500 to 1500, or even as much as to like 4,000. It kind of it depends on where they are, but they didn't really break it down to why that was specifically the case in terms of why, for example, in West Ontario, it was 400. It could just be from Ontario being more expensive, but that's a little unclear. Um, but that was a big factor into. Uh, something that wasn't really addressed in the trial simply because it was covered by the trial or the center itself. Um, and then you, here you can kind of see, uh, they try to break it down in terms of whether or not prior training or even uh, what we perceive as cognitive status, so the MMSE, or even their age would affect their training time. And you can kind of see here that prior training or the access they use doesn't really affect the number of training sessions, whether it's a fistula, whether it's a graft or a tunnel dialysis catheter. You can kind of see that their experience didn't really affect much either in terms of their prior training. So whether that's no experience in center or in terms of cleaning their catheters or self-care, whether they've self cannulated in the past, in both, it doesn't really affect how many training sessions they required. Um, you can kind of see in the MMSSE score that it's really scattered. You can't, there isn't really a correlation between what we might uh, associate with a cognitive mentality and number of training sessions required. Uh, but one of, the big, one of the big things they could see is that age is generally associated with requiring more training. Although you can kind of see that it can be quite variable in terms of how much training required. So for example, like this 70 year old required less than 20, which is definitely on the lower end compared to this 20 year old who required, you know, close to 40. But there is a general trend that the older they are, the more sessions they required, but that was very variable for a lot of patients. And it, it, it would be more of an individualized thing than um, uh, potentially an actual uh, issue with training itself. Um, kind of questions about the results at all? So to kind of summarize, um, they, they found common barriers that patients kind of identified and they were trying to examine whether or not things would influence their training abilities. And that was kind of one of the concerns that was brought up in the training, uh, sorry, the questionnaire. So when you kind of look at the results, uh, some things, are, so one of the biggest uh, barriers obviously, or things that are not really addressed is that patients have to be pretty motivated to want to do this. So these are not our typical dialysis patients. Uh, in order to participate in the study, there was something they had already had to consider and kind of want to do. Um, so this may not reflect the general population of our dialysis patients, but these are similar barriers that were noted in uh, studies that have kind of studied why home chemo has been difficult for patients. Uh, they were kind of broke this down in two big categories of barriers. So one was situational, which can be very difficult to overcome and usually are prohibitive. So this is like inadequate housing or family support, uh, you know, in, uh, ineffective or inability to have a clean area to do it, or things like that, or even a, uh, like a structural housing issue. Um, and again, 83 or 87 of the patients did require it. So this could be something, especially if it's a financial thing that they wouldn't be able to pay for. Um, 
And then the other aspect is a psychological thing, and that was probably the most commonly cited bear with either lack of motivation, uh, comfort with the situation that they were in, that's in center chemo. Uh, and so, and as well as fear of cannulating themselves or things like that. I think there are some things that uh, we can maybe do, and I, I know that uh, I think David Hunt is probably gonna talk about some of these things too, uh, is that one is to try and stress the benefits of home hemo for some patients, if that's something they think they can uh, benefit from, and then trying to teach them themselves about how to self-cannulate. So one of the things they just uh, talked about was something called the button pull technique, where they basically cannulate the same site to kind of create a pseudo tunnel for easier um, cannulation, or even ways to try and keep the needles in to try and reduce the fear of either the needle, the cap is disconnecting, especially while sleeping, if you're the nocturnal chemo version. Um, so kind of just addressing this, and a lot of it's just kind of based on the training. And again, kind of the data reflected that if, you know, whether they graduated high school, which the majority of people did, but even those who didn't, or even didn't graduate college, that really wasn't a barrier to patients learning how to do chemo, um, as well as, as uh, they use a cognitive score, the MMSSD to kind of determine whether that would be related, and it doesn't. Uh, the only real thing is that whether or not age would be related, and again, that can be quite variable. Because the population study was so small, though, they didn't really examine whether or not significant medical comorbidities would be effective or a barrier to doing home immunos, such as you know, diabetes or heart failure or a really bad hypertension or hypotension. They didn't really look at these things or and how they would affect their ability to do home chemo, whether that be a psychological or a situational concern. Um, but the general gist of the study is that um, a lot of the barriers are kind of similar as before, which are kind of divided to situational or psychologic, and some of them can be overcome. Uh, but again, one of the big things that were not really addressed was the financial concern and uh, the modifications that required for home to effectively do home hemo because a lot of it was covered by the either the dialysis center or the study itself. And I think the financial barrier, especially for a lot of our patients, may be a barrier, especially if uh, their insurance doesn't cover it. Um, questions? Hi, so that was, uh, that was a great overview. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Uh, that was a great overview. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. um, and then I don't know if you can, if you can put yourself on mute. Okay, awesome. Yeah, because I think I was, I was getting echo. Um, so uh, CJ Zhang, he did mention, and this is for everybody, is there a barrier for renters to do home hemodialysis? The landlords will not allow it. I, yeah, I have heard anecdotally that that is issue with some patients who are renting. Um, do other people have other experience with that? Tom has his hands up, hand up. I don't know if he wants to respond to that or had another comment. Well, I think you know me, Matt, well enough to know that I can re respond to almost anything. The question is, does it make any sense? <laughs> <clears throat> that, by the way, the uh, with regards to the the renters, the the next aid system breakthrough was really helpful because there are no adaptations. Sometimes electrical bills go up a little bit, but. Uh, there are no adaptations for that system. So that system was a breakthrough. Um, I was able to get, uh, some of you know that when renal care group uh, was brought into Fresenius, uh, Joe Pulliam was head of renal care group home program and then was Ray Hakim's right hand at Fresenius. And uh, even though they didn't publicize it, uh, I was able to get uh, $2,500 a year uh, we called them scholarship, a $2,500 one-time scholarship, in quotes, scholarship uh, uh, paid by Fresenius to get people on home dialysis. So the, the typical cost uh, uh, in Tennessee for adaptation of a home to, say, the Baby K, which was a system we were using uh, prior to Next Stage, was uh, in, it was closer to $4,000. Uh, and in New Zealand, and Mark Marshall has filled me in on this, it is uh, pretty expensive. The, the government in New Zealand pays for it, but what the government in New Zealand doesn't pay is for the six months of training and the loss of work that goes on. 
with the helper. And, and so you'd say, why six months? It, it just is. In, in New Zealand, uh, home hemo is six month training. So a lot of what this gets to then is uh, with regards to the anxiety about cannulation starting early in the game, and particularly because many patients that are on in-center hemo and subsequently go to home hemo, if that cannulation process starts while they're there, then that cuts down on the training time too. And I see David is nodding. Uh, at Vanderbilt, the, by the way, at Vanderbilt, we have 65% of all new starts start at home. Now that's still 90% uh, PD and 10% uh, hemo. But unlike many places in the country, uh, uh, our home hemo patients are, are an, uh, incident patients. It, it's not like many places in the country where they start in center. but and, and so this is where transitional care units came into play. As you guys are, are all aware that these transitional care units start the cannulation process. Uh, patients may or may not choose to go home, but they start the, the self-cannulation thinking even for if the patients decide to stay in center. So there, these, it was great to identify some of these barriers and, and there's many efforts now going on to uh, to alleviate some of them. But I do want to point out, don't give up. And I know a lot of you uh, uh, on the West Coast have a lot of DaVita units. Uh, don't give up on, on uh, browbeating uh, DaVita into helping. Uh, and they, like I said, uh, we called them scholarships before uh, to help uh, uh, alleviate some of that cost of some of the home trans transition, equipment transition, electrical transition, water transition. So I just want to mention uh, a comment in the chat by Roy Matthew before um, asking David to comment. But uh, Roy Matthew mentioned, it seems like some of these should be updated with a more recent survey. I agree. I would imagine modification costs are different with the utilization of pre-filled bags with next stage. Um, barring use of Tableau, even with Tableau, modifications would be minimal and potentially less fears around disconnect disconnections with treatments while awake. So. Um, David, I was wondering if uh, you could comment. Well, actually, you know, obviously we're looking to hear your comments on, on any of these things, but uh, maybe if you could just give a quick background of how you came to home uh, hemodialysis and then what your reaction was to some of these re um, responses. Because as Jonathan had noted, this survey that was sent out, it was actually sent out to the investigators and the study coordinators and what their impression of why um, some of these, uh, some of these, Patients may have been reluctant to um, do home hemodialysis. They, it actually was in the survey of the of the patients themselves. Awesome. Uh, thank you uh, again for the opportunity. Um, you know, happy to be here and uh, be able to use the platform to share my share my comments and my journey and my story. Uh, my name is David Rush. Uh, I am a home hemodialysis patient. I do every other day on a tablet machine. Um, I do three hours and forty five minutes a day. I've been doing dialysis since, ever since 2007, March 16th, 2007 was my first in-center treatment. Unfortunately, crashed into dialysis, but I knew uh, that I was having kidney issues all the way as early as 10th grade when I went for my football physical and found out that it was too much protein in my urine. Uh, then went to a specialist and um, that's when he told me you want to do a biopsy on the kidney, saw scarring on the tissue of the kidney. Uh, me being a 16, 15 year old kid, you know, I'm just thinking, hey, man, just give me the medication so I can get better and, you know, get on with my life. I just wanted to play ball and be a teenager. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, unfortunately, that's not how it went. Ended up missing that full year of uh, football my junior year. Uh, came back my senior year and ended up getting hurt and, and missing out on a scholarship to play ball in college. Um, I then, you know, transferred down to Georgia, where I went to school, Art Institute of Atlanta for video production, multimedia, worked down here a bit, moved back home. My girlfriend was doing internal medicine um, as her as her job as a medical assistant, bought me in to get my physical done. Um, of course, from that gap between hearing about my treatment, getting on some medication to help prevent um, kidney failure and living the college lifestyle, of course, medications, doctor visits, all that stuff was forgotten. Uh, being a teenager, um, you know, a few thousand miles away from home uh, and thinking that you're a kid and invincible and that only older people get sick. Uh, so when I got home, 
my girlfriend, now wife, uh, took me in, got my physical done. And that's when all my blood work and information came back. And my creatinine levels were super high. My blood pressures were super high. Everything was off. Of course, I didn't feel like anything was wrong at the time because, you know, when you're sick, sickness is a feeling that you start to become accustomed to and you're normal with that feeling and headaches and all this stuff is just, oh, I didn't sleep well. You know, you start making excuses for yourself. So all these feelings that I know now were symptoms I was feeling, but, you know, didn't know it was anything more than just feeling sick or being tired, but it was mostly that my kidneys were failing. I was diagnosed with FSGS soon thereafter. And I was told if I didn't start dialysis in a year that I wouldn't see my 25th birthday. So um, that year, I kind of just lived life, worked as much as I could, and I uh, was really kind of just rebellious about the whole situation. Not that I didn't care. I just was more in shock and, you know, you go through a sense of like trauma and depression and all the stuff when you feel like, hey, my, my life is about to drastically change with something that you have no clue about when you're not educated about it. Um, crash into dialysis and in March, like I said, of 2007, my first dialysis did in center for about six, seven weeks in the hospital. Creatinine was about 14 when I started. I was really, really sick. And, and then um, from there, I transferred out to a DCI unit where I did treatment there and I uh, was doing in center for a while and came to know home dialysis when um, I was still doing music this whole time before I really got sick. And one of my songs got to the ears of a famous artist by the name of Pitbull. And um, he wanted me to do music with him at the time. And I thought that he wouldn't sign me because of my health condition. So I didn't tell him. <laughs> and so um, I was doing dialysis and stuff and he would want me to fly out to Miami and work with him. And I would only tell him I can do it on the weekends. Cause of course, when you do an in center, your weekends are off if you're a Monday, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday patient like I was. So I would leave dialysis. Uh, I, would, I was doing five hours, three times a week. And so I would leave dialysis uh, Friday afternoon, get on a flight, go to Miami, work all night, work all day Saturday, work all day Sunday, fly the red eye back on Sunday night and go straight to my dialysis unit at 5 a.m. and do treatment. And uh, I didn't want to tell him why I, how I always had to leave so fast until he came to New York one day and wanted me to come out to a meeting in New York. And I told him I couldn't come. And it was because I had dialysis. And that's when I had to tell him because, you know, how do you say no to the boss? <laughs> and um, he was just like, man, why didn't you tell me? And I told him, I didn't, you know, back then music, you know, if you were sick or anything, it was almost like a sign of weak, weakness, you know, and I was young and they only looked at it as soft and just stuff that I, stupid thinking as a youngster, now I understand like, you know, my life is way more important than that. But um, it was just an image thing. And uh, when I told him, it actually pushed him more to want to work with me more for my resilience and being that I was doing this thing while still performing and coming out to Miami and working all these hours, he was just blown away by it. Um, so he then asked me maybe about a year later if I wanted to go on tour in 2009. I remember being in dialysis when I got the call in center and I quickly said yes, not knowing how I was going to ever treat and do a 42 city tour um, all over the United States. And so I Googled uh, mobile dialysis. And the reason I Googled it was because in the beginning, what I tell a lot of people is when you're told that your life is going to all turn this direction, you kind of go deaf, dumb, and blind for those first three to six months. I'm sure that there was talks about modality changes and all that stuff, but the pamphlets and all that, we don't see those as patients. We don't hear you. We don't, it, you have to continue, continually, continuously remind us, talk to us, educate us, because we are basically going through a form of trauma and just recollecting the fact that our lives are now changing. When you're sitting in a, a, a unit and you leave on Friday, come back Monday, and the person that you treated with for a month, two months, three months, a year is gone. And, you know, and, and people are passing left and right of you. And it's people that you treated with and became community with. It's a, it's a form of trauma to the mind, honestly. And so it's a really difficult time that we have to go through um, in there. So after that, I found, I started on the next day's machine. Um, I trained for it six weeks, took it home, started on it, and actually took the next day's machine on a 42 city tour <laughs> with Pitbull. And um, I did every city in the world. I, I never missed a show. I treated in every city around the world, helped with the, I was with DaVita at the time, and I would stop at different locations along the way and pick up units. My machine would go bad. I'll switch units out. It was really 
something that I would definitely do again, but it was definitely a, a trial and a journey, but I was happy to be able to do it. And um, I ended the tour at Radio City Music Hall for two nights. And, um, you know, when I got back off of tour, I was then told that I was a candidate for a transplant. And then my brother went and gave me a kidney transplant. My anniversary was actually um, November 9th. Uh, it was 2010, November 9th, that he gave me that kidney. It lasted me a strong seven and a half years. And I ended up losing it. But in that time, my two kids were born and I was able to be home with my two kids and raise them for those, you know, vital early, you know, early times of childhood. And my wife was able to go back to work and I was able to be daddy to care at home, not have to do dialysis and just be there for my children, which was amazing. And I'm totally grateful and honored to be able to do so. And then I uh, felt myself getting the symptoms that I had before, try to save the kidney plasma for ECs, chemo, chemo, um, treatments, all type of treatments to try and save the kidney, but ended up losing the kidney, went back on next stage again for a while. Um, and then 2019 ended up uh, feeling sick again, going into the hospital and my native kidneys were the size of lemons, of melons, my right native kidney. And um, doctor informed me that I had to take them out. we also having complication with my transplanted kidney. So after losing that kidney, I had to take that kidney out first, surgery, and then surgery to take out my gallbladder because it was expanding for some reason and ended up being related to the native kidney expanding because it was pushing the organs over in my body. That's how big it got. So after having a nine hour surgery, it took out both my kidneys. After breaking it down on a table, they realized there was a mass in it and I was living with kidney cancer for a whole year in 2019 and didn't even know. But luckily today I'm cancer free. And um, you know, ever after that, I was just kind of, we get a burnt out phase. I was burnt out, didn't want to do home treatment no more. Because the burden of home treatment sometimes could be, you know, your house is filled with these boxes. You know, we lived in a smaller house then. And it was like with kids, two kids, a wife, me, you know, if my boxes are all over the place and their stuff is all over the place. And I just felt like I was burdening the home. I felt like I was turning my home into a, a, a dialysis center. And I felt like I was burdening my family and I, they didn't deserve for my stuff to be everywhere and it to be about me. And I just wanted to be tucked away in a corner. So I definitely had that patient burnout and um, I opted to go back in center. And just wanted to go in, put my arm out, get my treatment done, and just go home. And I had to clean up anything or make or batch and make batches and hang bags. I didn't want to have to do any of that anymore. And um, then I was told about the tablet machine, ended up seeing what that was about, and ended up getting back on home dialysis around the time of COVID. Um, and um, been on home dialysis ever since the end of 2020, October, and been doing good since since then, just doing home dialysis, traveling advocating as much as I can, still living a full life, being a father, doing music, and just living a life. So definitely um, been a long road and, and grateful to still be on it to tell the story. As far as the comments, um, I totally agree with a few of the things that were there as far as finding candidates for home dialysis. Um, number one, I'll, I'll address the cannulation thing. You saw me shaking my head. You know, like, yeah, man, you know, these people need to start to do cannulation in center. I feel like as soon as they're introduced and having to do dialysis, it should be introduced in the beginning. So that way, these candidates, the people that may be able to go home, you get patients to that point where they're excited about going home. You show them all these positive things. You go home in your own environment. You can do it on your own time. You can drink more. You can eat more. You can do all these. And we give them all these positive things. And then when we get to, but you have to put the needles in yourself, that's when the big red neon light comes on and they're like whoa you know what I mean like I can't do that what if this and that's when all the fear starts to rush in understandably and it's you know it's not home dialysis is not for the weak you know let me say that clearly it's not you're going to have issues you're going to go through things there's going to be malfunctions of the machine your pressure venous pressures your arterial pressures are going to go up you have to learn how to adjust on the fly. You have to learn to tape and retape and move and cannulate. And there's a lot of moving parts in it. So whenever I talk about finding a candidate for home dialysis, I always talk about the three W's. Number one, they have to have the will. They have to have the will to want to the will to do dialysis at home. The will comes with reasoning of, of knowing what comes with the home dialysis, the responsibility of dialysis. And just the overall experience of home dialysis, they have to have the why. Finding a why for a patient can be something that takes a little time. You know, every patient is not built off their flow sheet. Every pain, patient is an in individual person. The flow sheet is just information about their health state, never about who the person is. 
So I think, you know, these, these doctors and these nurses need to take time to get to know these patients. Everybody's not a candidate just from saying, hey, he's young, he's a candidate. There's a lot that goes into that. And, you know, there has to be a why there. You know, maybe they are sick of missing their grandkids' baseball games. Maybe they're sick of not being able to go to the wedding out of state. You know, there's reasons why people want to be able to do things. Maybe they miss missing their kid, picking their kids up and dropping them off to school because their time for dialysis is too early and they miss, miss walking them to the bus. Something that small can be a reason why a person want to go home. And then there has to be the want. A patient has to want to go home. They have to want to learn the candidate. They have to want to know, you know, that I'm going to be home and doing this. And there may be obstacles that I have to face. They have to want to be educated. They have to want to do these things. And that all leads to the biggest W of all, everybody knows me, is the win. The win is them knowing that they're a candidate and they go home. You know, it, it, and, and trust me, every patient isn't a candidate. And that's just what it is. Everyone's not going to be able to go home. Everyone's not built for home dialysis. And that's okay. Um, you know, I always tell patients, there's no pressure. Everybody has their own preference. There's no cookie cutter patient. The next patient next to me in the chair is nothing like me. And, um, you know, people say, hey, you do dialysis, you, you get others to try and get home. And I do, but I just have a simple conversation with them and let them know what my experience is. And then, you know, my experience is going to be nothing like theirs. And uh, I think the support system and stuff like that is definitely a thing. The environment where they live, um, is definitely, you know, part of it. And being at home, the burden of dialysis, yes, I'm the one putting the needles in, but my whole family does dialysis. Everybody does it. When I put those needles in, my wife does dialysis. My kids do dialysis with me. They're there. They see me. The schedules change at home. When daddy has to do treatment, we can't leave right now. We, if we want daddy to go, we have to wait three hours and 45 minutes and maybe another additional hour so he can, you know, recoup. And that's just part of the game. It's a full team effort here. At my home doing dialysis, um, I'm just, you know, blessed and humbled to be able to have good experiences on it. I've had my bad experiences on it. I've been through the fire in dialysis, up, down, left, right, good, bad, and ugly, and the beautiful. And, um, you know, I think patients are strong people. You know, anyone with chronic diseases has a certain type of strength that they have the will to live, that they can do anything that they put their mind to. I do think cantillation should be started in center before anyone gets talked to, talk to about home. And, you know, I agree that it should be done way beforehand. And um, I feel like that's the biggest barrier besides location and environment and all those type of things. But cantillation being number one, number two being environment, uh, number three being just the overall confidence of a patient. Um, and, you know, the, the, I always say that the plug, the bridge, to knowing who is the, a real candidate is those techs and those nurses. They spend the most time with the patients in center. They're part of the family. They're therapists for us. They're, they know us, they're friends. They know when we're upset. I used to walk into treatment. I might not be feeling good and they could look at me and know because every day they would smile and today's down, what's wrong? Like these people are the bridge for these patients to know who is the perfect candidate. You know, when a doctor comes in, you wanna know something about a patient, ask the tech that deals with them every other day. That's when you'll find out the real meat about that patient. So I always tell people, if you're trying to find candidates and, you know, in, in, in center, uh, you know, be water, man. You know, water can break down rocks over time. Just take time, talk to them, get to know them as a person, find out their strengths, their weaknesses, and then determine if they're candidates or not. Um, a simple conversation can lead you to the why, will, and the want for any patient. And, uh, you know, I just, any anybody out there looking for home dialysis, have questions, stuff like that. I'm a liaison for you. I'm here to help. And I'm just grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was, I love listening to you speak because it's just, it's all so powerful. Um, there are so Thank many you. comments. Yeah, there's so many comments in the chat saying, again, very inspiring story. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, that it's a great perspective to continually revisit available modalities for each patient at each phase of their life. Um, and there are a couple of people who wanted to know what can you highlight the major differences between Tableau and Next Stage from your perspective? Um, sure. And, you know, what do you like about it? And, and how do you feel about traveling um, since it's something that you cannot bring with you? Um, OK, well, my, my differences and you know, just to disclaimer at the beginning, I am grateful for all modalities. OK, whether it's in center, Next Stage, Tableau, whatever it may be, whatever the patient preferences peritoneal, whatever it is, whatever works for you, 
go with that. <laughs> okay. So like that, I just want to put that out there. I did next stage for two and a half years. It saved my life. It, it allowed me to do things that I never thought I would be able to do. It allowed me to tour the country. It allowed me to follow my dreams. So I'll always be grateful and indebted for the next stage time that I have with them. Um, and so the difference is the main difference for me between the tableau and next stage is basically just one is the batching process. Um, you know, because of my size, I was a, a, a bigger leader batcher. So I, I had to do, I would use a whole batch during treatment. So I would have to make batches every night. And um, sometimes, and, th and this is again, to the mental aspect of doing dialysis and, and it almost being a burden in your home. I don't know if you guys know the sound, but when you're batching that machine, that gung, 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 that, that sound every night it would do something to me. And I felt like no one said this, but I felt like, man, I'm always interrupting the home. Like I'm always, we were in a small house and I just felt like I was doing so much and my boxes were everywhere. And I just felt like I was overtaking my house. So if, if when I was traveling, doing my speaking, then if I didn't batch or if I missed my batch point, I would have to come home, drain and rebatch again. And the process to batch is almost like six to eight hours. And the process to drain is almost like four or five hours. I think I may be off. Don't quote me. Or you can pull the bag out, cut it, and drain it like that. But <laughs> but um, I will always miss my batching. And if I have to hang bags, being that I was a higher leader batcher, I would have to use ten hanging bags. And with ten hanging bags, the the spider and the thing was only built for like six. So I would have to hang in the middle of treatment, which is, is like you know a little bit harder. So the main things for me is the batching because on Tableau is on site batching. Within 15 minutes, you're ready to go. Um, and this is just comparing. And um, the setup is a little bit quicker as well for me. And also, um, you know, the the numbers. So I remember next stage, I remember the Bible, I called it. If you had an alarm, you got these numbers, like 0, 3, 4, 2, 5. And I, you'd be like, what is that? You know, <laughs> you're losing your mind while it's dinging, dinging. And you're, you're scrambling, trying to find out what this code is and what's wrong with the machine. And but opposed to the tableau, when you get an alarm, it's a screen like an iPad that kind of tells you what's going on, like immediately says, hey, you're kinking. Hey, there's this. Hey, fix this. Hey, fix that. And you can kind of see it, fix it and move on. Um, that's just some of the small things that are different about it. Now, as far as traveling, I extensively, extens extensively traveled with the next day machine. Like I said, I did a whole 42 city tour with it. Um, but I did travel with six guys that looked like me, that were 250 pound football players. And that's how I traveled around with this 85 pound machine, 100 pound machine when it's in the metal case. So it was a little bit easier for us to lug that thing around and move it around um, then. But if I was traveling in a car, it's great for stuff like that. Pop it in the car to go to the next state and do treatment from somewhere like that. It's great for things like that. It's great for campers, RVs and stuff like that. When you have the bags hanging, it's great for that. Um, but the extent that I traveled with it, it was the movement that I did, the amount of stuff we were moving, taking flights and all that. Um, it was a little bit harder, but luckily I had six of my closest friends and brothers that were able to help me lug it around. With Tableau, it comes with a patient key. Also, I don't have to fill out any flow sheets or anything while doing treatment. Um, everything is in the My Tableau. It all gets documented straight to the Tableau and sent over to your doctor and your nurse in real time while you're doing treatment. They can see everything going on, every blood pressure. You can't cheat on your blood pressures and <laughs> all that type of stuff. You know, there's no flow sheets. The flow sheet is the My Tableau. So as soon as I'm done with treatment, the email is sent over to my nurse and my doctor immediately with all my information. And I can actually see it on the app as well for if anyone asks me my flow sheets where I can pull them up and have them, you know, at the touch of my finger. So that's another um, plus with the Tableau. I have a patient key with the Tableau that has all your uh, information on it, um, your prescription and everything on it. So when I travel, I just got back from Hawaii. I was in Hawaii for work. And when I went to Hawaii, I just bought my patient key. I didn't have to pack any saline. I didn't have to pack any needles. I didn't have to pack any gauzes, band-aids, anything. I just walked into the facility that had the Tableau, of course, popped it in and did my treatment there. Now, if there's not a tablet there, I just simply do an in-center treatment, regular in-center treatment and cantilate myself there as well and just knock out a regular treatment in-center on a regular machine and go about my day. So that's usually how I travel um, with the tablet. Awesome. Thanks so much. And there's somebody who asked, um, and this is for everyone, uh, including you, David, do you know anyone who's doing assisted home hemodialysis 
for people who are just starting on home hemo. So there's a lot of assisted uh, peritoneal dialysis programs. And um, CJ Zeng, who asked this question, he actually piloted one in California. So uh, when patients are first starting on PD, they'll send a nurse or a tech to help them uh, get used to PD at home. And then a lot of times the patients become independent and then the helpers transition out. Um, hmm. Does anybody here know about that? I know when I started, uh, typically nurses, you know, nurses did come the first couple, you know, like the first week or so, they would come and just make sure you're set up and running smoothly. And if you ran into any issues and stuff like that, when I first started, um, I know that was something that they did for me. Um, and then I was kind of off and running after that on my own. Um, but as far as, you know, full assistant home you know, dialysis, I'm not sure of anyone that's really doing that. I mean, I know that, um, like I said in the beginning, there were nurses here, if not here, calling during my treatments, just checking in on me like continuously, making sure I was good, um, and, and to the point where you kind of take your baby steps, and once you're off running, they kind of let you go and fall for yourself. Um, but uh, that's that's the most I know about it. And um, you know, I, I, other than that, I really know any too in depth uh, assisted HHD. Tom, have you heard of any assisted uh, home hemo programs? I know it's usually more common. I mean, PD is just more common in general than home hemo. And I know a lot of home hemo programs are more conservative and they require that there's somebody who can help at home. Uh, some of some, There are some home hemo programs I know that are very reluctant to train patients solo at home. So I don't know if that's part of the reason why it's not as common. You had three questions there, Jenny. Uh, uh, one was uh, assisted at home. Uh, I I heard that there are some grants to look at that, where they're actually paying uh, people to go out and do that. And I do believe you're you're correct that it's a, a early in the course. Uh, but when now with uh, hourly wages, what they are, that would be prohibitive. Let me give you the history that we did in the early '80s. Uh, I worked with Chris Blagg at the University of Washington, and we we had gotten a, a home assistant for for hemo at the time, and uh, Medicare paid four dollars an hour, four dollars a session, not an hour, four dollars a session, and that was was crazy. That we just couldn't we couldn't do that, uh, and so there occasionally have been some state grants. Uh, I've heard, and anybody speak up if you're aware of such things, but but I've heard, uh, uh, I know that Rachel Fussell and I think uh, uh, Becky Sasashi are a couple of players that are at least looking into that, but I think it's still on the, uh, on the drawing board experimentally. Uh, and I, you ask, I think another question was uh, 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 solo. Uh, even before Next Stage was approved for solo, most of the guys I know that were doing Next Stage, including me, uh, allowed it uh, to go solo. Uh, and now, Next Stage was approved, I'm going to guess, about four or five years ago for solo use at home during the day, but not at night. And that, that, that doesn't stop me from doing it at night. I don't have any such buddy doing that now, but but so even before it was approved, we did allow solo and uh, uh, and then solo during the day is now allowed. I, I would it be interested, David, did, was, did you always cannulate yourself? Did you ever have a central venous catheter at all, ever? Um, when I first started, I did have the catheter. Um, like I said, I crashed into dialysis and, they, and I had the catheter in my chest for about, I wanna say almost four to five months. Um, and then I had a fistula put in. And then from then on, I've been uh, cantilating. I was I was not cantilating myself in the beginning until I started the training for home. And that's when I started to cantilate myself. So uh, I uh, both Matt and uh, Shweta uh, were at the HDU that we had a few weeks ago. And the discussion came up there about uh, central venous catheters. And I think 
all of us have patients on central venous catheters on home hemo. Uh, and, and so we, our emotions are the following, uh, less anxiety about disconnect and less anxiety about infection, but still anxiety about central venous catheters. But I think all of us doing home hemo have patients with central venous catheters. And I would add that central venous catheter shortened training time by, by about one third maybe one third to one half, just shorten the training time, which is already quite long. Right. I think we did, um, for my initial training, I remember it being six weeks for the next day's training. And then Tableau was a two week training um, that I was home. But of course the training for Tableau is a little bit quicker to me because me having prior home experience, um, it was a little bit faster for me to uh, get home. So, um, you know, but the normal, I think the normal training time is two weeks. So about a week and a half for me, but normal two week training course, training time for Tableau. And I remember it being a full six week training course for the next stage. And I believe that was around the 2009 time, 2008, 2009 time, uh, when they were really just being fully introduced into the market, I guess, you know, for full home use. And uh, I too was a solo guy, <laughs> was a solo guy. And um you know, I, I, my my wife, uh, girlfriend at the time, wife and everything like that was at at yelling, at yelling for, uh, capacity. Where if I needed some some a snack or some water, but uh, you know, I, I never expect nobody to sit there the whole time. You know, we did have care partners. She was part of the training with me, so she knew how to disassemble and assemble the machine. If any emergencies, she knew all that stuff. And I mainly treated when um someone was around, but you know, I wasn't dependent and waiting on someone. I I mostly just navigated it on my own. I just Thank wanted you. to, to uh, answer Whaling's question here in the chat because others may be wondering. We've we've talked a lot about Tableau, but just to be clear, why it's different than Next Stage when it comes to portability. So Tableau uh, does on-demand dialysate generation. So um, unlike Next Stage, where you have two options, one are the bags that you hang as David has outlined. And then the other option is batch generation through the pure flow uh, system, which generates these things called sacks, which are either 40, 50, or 60 liters of dialysate, which can be used over uh, one or two sessions typically. Um, and obviously you don't take the pure flow system with you when you travel, but you can get the bags of dialysate, which you can either take with you for short trips or get sent ahead on uh, longer trips, but with Tableau, because the dialysate is being generated during your dialysis session, it's not prepared ahead of time, um, that uh, whole water purification system is sort of has to be attached to the, the Tableau system. So it, it's just not, uh, it's not portable in that sense. I remember having my stuff sent out to, uh, actually took my next next stage machine on my honeymoon. So I had it sent out to Vegas. Uh, from Jersey, and um, remember getting anything sent out there, and uh, like you know, did a lot of traveling with it, stuff like that. So definitely a great system for people who you know want to travel, uh, want to be able to do their dialysis anywhere. Um, as far as um mobility and stuff like that, it's a great source for that. And I think I answered by in the chat. Tableau is more like a a set based. Uh, it's also used on the floor in hospitals, used on the floor in um, in centers and uh, it's also used on, so it's mainly a floor machine that's just able to be used at home. So those were the main differences that I think I was answering in the chat with somebody as well too. So definitely two great machines to be used for patients. Choices. Thanks. And Tiende mentioned that for solo home hemo, you may request in-home support for assistance at the beginning of home hemo. And also, yeah, we have this issue that we're told the Vita patients aren't authorized to use Tableau yet. Um, I don't know if any of the rest of you are at the Vita units, um, the ones who have been able to get Tableau for your patients. Are you guys just at different um, different uh, dialysis units? We're wondering how to get the Tableau for our De Vita patients. Well, Jenny, there are several issues there. there. One is contractual, and the other is policies and procedures. So it doesn't matter that Tableau has policies and procedures. DaVita has to adapt them and approve them just like Fresenius does. So there's that. And then there could be the issue of, of contracts for the machines. Uh, 
uh, depends on who owns the unit, but there could be contractual issues too. Got it. And then since we're coming up at the end of the hour, um, David, I just wanted to ask you, do you have any last words of advice um, for us as uh, kidney doctors in terms of advice, in terms of how to approach you know, patients who, who might be interested or who we want to introduce the idea of home dialysis to? You know, in, in, in the famous words of Bruce Lee, I just say, be water, okay? It, it takes time to really get into a patient's needs uh, to the why and the wants. We're, we're there's, there's there's gruntle patients, there's happy patients, there's patients who don't really, who are just there and don't have a lack for living. And, you know, you there's all sorts. Um, you, you as doctors and, you know, social workers and people who deal with us on a almost other daily, weekly basis, you know, take time to talk about something other than dialysis. Nothing more a, hate, a patient hates than talking about dialysis at dialysis. Um, we don't want to talk about dialysis <laughs> at dialysis. Um, we never want to talk about dialysis. But, you know, I, I say, you know, sometimes just talk to patients about life, about other things, find out how they day went, find out what their dreams are, find out what they miss doing. Um, and those will give you all the reasons that you need to find out if that's a candidate. I mean, if you see when you, I, I, I've said this for years, if you ask a patient what they did before dialysis, you watch how they light up, watch how they start to talk about their past life, how they miss being normal and living a normal life. Um, we, that normal word is thrown around a lot for patients. And I feel like, you know, as you guys take time, I'm not telling you to sit and take 40 minutes to an hour every patient, but when you have those couple minutes with your patients, talk something other than dialysis. And in that you will find um, what you need and, and um, you know, get with the text, get with the nurses, find out more about them on your own time. And then you'll, you'll really find who the candidates are. Even the ones that don't talk much, they've talked to someone and you, know, you can definitely just be water. We are rocks. Unfortunately, we come in and we turn into rock and we don't wanna deal with a lot of things. And some of us who are nice, some of us who just don't wanna deal with nothing. And you know, water can break down rock. That is the, one of the greatest things I've ever seen a waterfall form a rock, for, you know, smooth it out. So if you just be water to us patients, I'm sure at one point we will be smoothed out and you will find the why, the will and the what, and you know, and you'll, and you'll, hate, you'll find your candidates in the, in the conversation. Well, thank you so much for that, David. Thank you to all of you guys for attending today. Um, and then we'll see you again in January. Take care. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Jenny, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. So I see that you guys are recording this session and uh, you know, for the central time zone, um, Osama, I and Miguel,